Now, I've been reading a lot and watching a lot of videos and going to other people's talks at, at uh, other conferences, not this one, where um, people talk about a lot of the benefits that come when using a microservices architecture. And from the experience that I have of building a lot of distributed applications over the many years, I think some of these benefits are really more like myths. And I don't really believe that they're true. Uh, and I think that we could have been doing these things for years and we didn't need a microservices architecture to do this. So I'm going to share you know, my opinion of some of these, what I will be calling myths as opposed to benefits. So a common uh, belief that is spread about microservices is that they offer small, easy to understand and manage code bases. And that you, if you build microservices, that you will get this. Well, quite honestly, I think we've been doing this for decades. That's really what object-oriented programming was all about. You build these classes, which are small, self-contained units of code that are easy to manage and easy to understand. So I think we've been doing that for a really long time, and microservices isn't really something that enables that per se. We've also been able to package these classes into libraries, you know, in the Windows world, dynamic link libraries, for example. And so while microservice architecture can maybe force developers into this because you are living in your service, you can have that kind of self-discipline today as a developer and have been doing it for the past several decades. So I don't think this is really a feature that you get with microservices at all. I think just some developer discipline is all you needed and we've been doing it for a long time. Um, and a benefit of using object-oriented programming in languages is that if you change something in a, in a DLL or in a class, then when you recompile the code, the code may not compile if there was something that broke. You know, you changed the signature of an API, for example, or you spelled something incorrectly. And this kind of compile time type safety is a very positive thing to have. It allows you to detect, detect bugs early before you start deploying code. Another myth is that a failing service doesn't impact other services. A lot of times when people talk about microservices, they say, well, when a, some service dies, the other service keeps going. Well, many services have really hard dependencies on other services in order to keep running. And therefore, that's kind of a myth and gets dispelled as well. And it is hard for developers to write and test code that gracefully recovers when dependency fails. A lot of developers don't even really try it and make sure the catch blocks are correct. And the example I gave earlier of the authentication service being down, and then how do you let them still look at the products that you're selling, even though they can't put things in their shopping cart. A lot of times people don't think through those scenarios. So it does require extra effort to get you to this place. Just being microservices doesn't make that just magically happen for you. And we run multiple service instances, so there's no such thing as failure. In a lot of these cloud worlds, and it's certainly true of service fabric, you usually have multiple instances of the microservice running. So if one of the instances fails, the system that you're using will restart that service and keep it running again. So it's not like it's not running for a long period of time. And there's multiple instances of it, so then network requests can go to an instance that's up instead of the one that's down. So again, it's not really this failing service doesn't impact others is kind of a myth as well because of that. And <clears throat> with a monolithic architecture, all of the components are either up or down at the same time. So you don't have to worry about this recovery code or what happens if this piece is in function and this piece is functioning. And then you might say, well, something might go down. But again, the system that you're using, like Service Fabric, will automatically restart that for you. And you might have multiple instances of it running in parallel. So if one instance goes down, client requests could be directed to another one that's up. So it's not really a big feature of uh, microservices to have that. So <clears throat> what I, uh, I've been thinking about this problem a lot about microservices and when should you use them. And I have, my current thinking anyway, is I've concluded that there are four reasons to break a monolith down into microservice architecture. And as far as I can tell, these are the only four reasons I can come up with. So the first reason is you want to have different pieces of code that scale independently of one another. For example, here I show an example of a photo share microservice where requests are coming in for people to look at photos or perhaps to go and upload photos. And when they upload photos, and only when they upload photos, do we need to go and create thumbnail images of those photos. So we have a separate service on the right, which is the thumbnailing service. And at certain times of year, if people are just looking at photos, we don't need a lot of the thumbnail service. At certain times of year, like holiday season, people take more photos, we might need to scale that up and add more instances to it. 
And then when the uh, time is over, we can go and scale it back down, and maybe we don't need as many as we needed before. So by making these two separate microservices, we can scale them independently of one another. All right, so that's the first reason. The second reason to use microservices is different technology stacks, which I alluded to earlier, where you might want to write one part of your program using some technology stack, like Node.js I have over here for the photo share service, and then maybe use uh, .NET to do the thumbnailing service. And then we will communicate between these two microservices using some kind of network communication. The third reason is to have independent deployments. Now, this is a lot of times what people think of as the holy grail of microservices, where let's say the guy or the team that's responsible for the thumbnailing service, right now they have version one deployed, and then they want to go and make some changes to it, so they're going to bring it down, bring it down, there we go, and bring up version two of the service over here, and version one of the photo share service, that just keeps running. And this is great, of course, and it gives you this agility, but there's also this downside of the lack of testing that may have happened. If these are two different teams, this team over here that's creating the thumbnail service can go and make a new version of it, and then they just deploy it, and maybe they never tested it with the photo share service, and possibly they broke some behavior. So there's some goodness here, but there's also some badness here, and your mileage may vary depending on what it is you're doing. The fourth reason that I identify to enable or establish a microservice architecture is a fairly esoteric one. Uh, so I don't think this is going to be the most common. I think these other three are far more common than the fourth. And the fourth one is conflicting dependencies. Imagine that we're building a monolithic service, which is this photo share service, and it uses some library, which I call some shared lib, and maybe it has a dependency on version one of that shared lib. Then it takes a dependency on this thumbnail DLL, another library, and the thumbnail code has a dependency on the shared lib, but it's a different version, version seven. Well, a lot of times, depending on the technology stack you're using, you can't have two different versions of a shared library in the same process, right? And so now you have some weird you know, dependency issue that's going on. So a way that you can fix this, of course, is to break it up into microservices, where you have the photo share service using shared lib, and that can be version one, and then you have the thumbnail service, and that's also using shared lib, and it's using version seven. And these are the four reasons that I can think of why people should split things up into microservices, and they're the they're only four that I can think of you know, in the past six months or since I had this revelation. Let's talk networking. Okay. Go. Okay, so <clears throat> when, as a software engineer, I'm constantly looking at, so I want this feature. In order to get this particular feature, what is it going to cost me? And then I do an analysis to say, okay, is it worth the cost in order to get this feature? So when you take a monolithic service and you break it down into microservices, what you're really doing is you're going to take what used to be a method call like this in your monolith, where you would call some method, you'd pass it some arguments, and it would return back to result. And you're going to turn that now into a network request that's going to go across the wire. And people don't, from my experience, people don't fully appreciate the cost of this. They think, well, we're just going to replace the method call with a network call. But it's substantially more expensive. So in order to do it, the first thing you got to do is you have to define an explicit language agnostic multi-version API contract. Because your service is going to be version 1, version 2, version 3. And you have a client that may be calling version 1 of the API or version 2 of the API. And you're going to need to maintain backward compatibility because you can't really update the clients and the servers at exactly the same time in any given system. So that, and you want it to be language agnostic so that you get one of the benefits of microservices where the client and the server are written in different technology stacks like .NET and JavaScript, for example, for Node.js. And when you switch from using some kind of API like this method here to something that's going to be a network request, you're going to lose things like IntelliSense, and you're going to lose refactoring in Visual Studio if you use tools like this. And you're going to lose compile time type safety. Right? So you're going to get this benefit of microservices with the four things that I showed you earlier, and it's going to cost you this in order to do it. Are you willing and prepared to take that cost? And I think these costs are pretty significant. They're pretty high. Uh, 
In addition, when I call this method, I'm passing in arg1 and arg2, whatever they happen to be. But in order to send them across the wire, I'm going to have to serialize them. So that's going to be a performance cost. It's going to be a memory cost. And of course, the data types that I'm using have to be serializable. Then I need to send them to the other side, and then the other side is going to go and deserialize them, which will be a time cost and a memory cost. And they have to be able to deserialize it, right? So you're changing it from one form, like a .NET class object, into maybe JSON or XML to send across the wire. So then you can then turn it into some other form, like a JSON object in JavaScript or deserialize it into Java on the other side. And then, of course, when the result comes back, you have to do the same thing. The result has to be serializable, and you have to go through this transformation, which, again, is going to be a memory hit and a perf hit, and it's going to restrict the data types that you can use for making these requests. And if only that were it, but the story gets substantially worse. <laughs> okay. So let's just do a quick comparison of making an in-process call to a method as opposed to making an HTTP request or some network request going across a wire. So I've already mentioned several times that the performance is going to be worse and it's going to increase network congestion. So if you're using the network for other things, now you have more traffic going across the network, so your network congestion will be increased by that. When you make network requests, they are unpredictable in time. So now your latency has gone up as well. If I make a network request, what if the server's not running? Right? In a monolith, it's running. Right? You're in the same process. You don't have to think about it. But if you're making a network request, well, there might be network congestion slowing you down. And what if it's not running? Or what if it takes an hour before it responds to your network request, before it replies back to you? How do you deal with that? So a lot of times people try to deal with that by using timeout values. Well, I'll make the request. But if it doesn't reply in one second, I'm just going to fail the request. Uh, and you can do that, but that can also be challenging too, especially in the face of retries, which is coming up soon on my slide here. Uh, and so you might end up wanting to use things like deadlines instead. Right? I'm processing a client request, and I need to have it completely finished in five seconds. And so I've made a request. It took one second. Well, now I only have four seconds left. And that's an easier way to manage timeouts is by working with deadlines instead. Network requests are unreliable, right? The network is always unreliable, and you have to consider it as such. So that frequently means that you'll be introducing retry loops into your code. I've made a request. The server came back and said it was busy. I want to go and loop around and retry the request again. Uh, and you might want to use some kind of exponential back off with that, right? I mean, do you see the pain? It's phenomenal pain <laughs> when making network requests to really do this in a resilient, robust way. You probably also want to use a circuit breaker pattern so that you don't start denial of servicing your own services by constantly retrying over and over and over again. So that's something else you would have to learn and incorporate into your code base. And if you're doing retries, it's possible that the server did get the request and is processing it, but your client-side code timed out. So if you do a retry, then you might be sending the same thing to the server, and now it might end up doing it twice. So you have to make sure that the server code that you implement is idempotent to make sure that there's no ill effect if it does the same operation twice. These are all very challenging things to really get right when you're building a microservice. Then, of course, since a microservice is sitting on a network somewhere, it's really callable by anything. An in-process call is only callable by the code that linked the DLL. But a service sitting on the network could be callable by anything that has access to it. So now you probably need to introduce things like authentication, authorization. Maybe you want to encrypt the data that's going across the wire in case other things are sniffing on the wire. Whereas when you were all in process, you didn't really have to think about these issues. And then, of course, your debugging of the situation, you know, of the system becomes more complicated. What if there are network issues and that's why things are failing? How do you look at performance counters, events, uh, logging information where some of the uh, processing is happening on one service, some of the processing is happening on another service, which may go and call a third service? And how do you aggregate all those logs together and make sense out of it? And then you might want to have some kind of causality ID or call stacks that go across all these different services so you know how you got to this place over here where there was a failure, which other services did it pass through before it got to you? Right? All these things are additional challenges in order to get those four benefits. So this, I think, is really, really hard to get right. Really, really hard to get right, which is why microservices should be very carefully considered. And if you are getting one of those four benefits, at least one of those four benefits I mentioned before, and that benefit's really important to you, then going down this path can make sense. 
Otherwise, you might just be better off with a monolithic service. Or maybe just you know, have a few, a few microservices and more monoliths as possible. It doesn't stop there. <laughs> yes, I know. Um, the next part is service endpoint discovery. So now you have some kind of cluster where services are being created, and those services are listening on ports. Well, how do the other services know in the cluster on what port the things are listening on? How does it know where they are on, as a network address, IP and port, so they can go and communicate with, the, with them? And in this world of building distributed, reliable services, services start and stop. You saw Vaz, he's dynamically creating services whenever he wants to start a new job. Each of those services he's dynamically creates could have its own endpoint to it. So you have to discover that endpoint somehow so you can go and talk to that service. You might want to scale up and down services. In the holiday season, when more people are buying things, you might want to scale up to 100 nodes to run your service. When the holiday season's over, you may want to scale down to only 50 nodes. So these service instances, each 100 of them has different IP addresses or endpoints to listen on. When you scale down to 50, 50 of those endpoints are no longer valid. They're gone. And of course, services may crash, a node may go down, a router may go out, a power supply may fail, a hard disk can fail. Right, in this world. Now, Service Fabric has built-in mechanisms to detect those kinds of things, and it can move a service from one node to another, or if a node goes down, it can create another instance somewhere else. So that means a valid endpoint is no longer valid. A new service comes up with a brand new valid endpoint. So endpoints for services are changing and are very fluid in this kind of world. Uh, so each instance creates its own endpoint, and they are typically dynamically assigned IP addresses and ports, and so you need a way to discover these so you can go and talk to the services. So clients have to dynamically discover the instances. Um, I'm not going to say that other part, but that, just, not that other part just makes it worse. <laughs> it's just another thing that makes it... All right, I'll say it. So, <laughs> okay. Service is up and running, and it has an IP address and port. This service over here discovers the IP and port. And then before it goes and calls it, this service goes down, another service comes up, and it's assigned the same IP and port. So now this guy thinks he's talking to the first service, and now he's talking to a different service. And that can happen, and I think it's a ticking time bomb for a lot of people when they build services, that they all of a sudden start sending data to a service that isn't the one they originally thought it was. And that's another thing that just makes this more complicated. So the way we typically... Um, try to deal with these kinds of issues, is when you stand up a cluster, you end up with something like a service registry service. Now, in uh, Service Fabric, we call this the naming service. And it basically is a, a dictionary of key value pairs where the key is the name of a service or a service identity, and the value is its endpoint. Then you can stand up some other service in here. So here I'm standing up a website service, which is some microservice, and you can have one or more instances of that. Then I stand up some other internal service in the cluster. I can have one or more instances of that. So let's just say that uh, each instance has its own endpoint. So when it comes up, it goes to the service registry or the naming service and says, I'm internal service number one, instance one, and here's my endpoint. And the other instance, let's say there's two instances, would say, I'm service number one, instance two, and here is my endpoint. Then we could stand up another internal service in the cluster as well. So this is internal service number two, and let's say we have two instances of it, so we also have two more entries in the naming service or service registry for the two instances for service two and what their endpoints are. So now this service registry has all this knowledge of all the instances running in the cluster and the endpoints that you would use to communicate with them. So now we'll put a load balancer in front of this. A client request will come in from the outside world, hit the load balancer. The load balancer will direct the traffic to the website service. The website service then wants to go and talk to an internal service, number one. So it goes to the, the service registry and says, hey, I'm looking for this instance of the service. The registry says, well, here's the endpoint that you can use to talk to it. That gets sent back, and then it can go and talk directly to the endpoint of the other service. Right? And so this is a one way of dealing with these kinds of mechanisms and doing this kind of endpoint discovery. Okay. Now, this can be rather challenging. And so what we have worked on uh, with the Visual Studio team at Microsoft is we are, we are currently in the process of creating a new Visual Studio template for service fabric that encapsulates some of the solutions for this problem into it. Um, if you look at the code at the bottom here, 
uh, and we make this available for you to download now. It's not as a Visual Studio formal template yet. We're trying to get feedback from customers on it to see how they like it before we put it into uh, the Service Fabric SDK proper. Um, and this uh, HTTPS here on GitHub, that's where you can download all the source code for this and where you can try it out. And if you look at that, you will see that somewhere in that source code, we are saying to you, well, you can use an HTTP client to do your communication from one service to the other. And then we're using this feature that's built into the .NET HTTP client of creating these filter handlers. And so we have written for you a circuit breaker HTTP message handler. Uh, and that will give you circuit breaker pattern support built into your HTTP request so that you don't start denial of service attacking your own microservices. And then that gets wrapped around an HP service client handler, an HP service client exception handler, and an HP service client status code retry handler. And those three handlers are about doing re-resolves. Like you make an HTTP request to the service and it doesn't, it's not there anymore. We will go back to the naming, these filters will go back to the naming service, get the latest address, and then go back and retry the service again. So it will do automatic retries for you and automatic re-resolves of the endpoints for you. And then just for fun, we also have an HTTP trace message handler. This is a way for you to get tracing to flow throughout your HTTP requests from one to the other to help with the debugging story there. So I would encourage you to take a look at this, download this code, experiment with it, and we would love to have feedback on it before we put it into the pro uh, product proper. Another thing to consider about networking, always fun topic, is about load balancer probes. Um, people don't, they basically ignore the load balancer. Once they set it up, they kind of set it up and they forget it. But there's a lot of interesting stuff to do with the load balancer. So let's just first talk about how the load balancer works. Here I have three different virtual machines, VM1, VM2, VM3, and the load balancer knows about those three, and we've set up a load balancer probe so that the load balancer will end up probing all three of these VMs every 15 seconds. So when the load balancer sends a probe to those VMs, those VMs all return HTTP 200, and that tells the load balancer all these VMs are fine, you can direct traffic to any of them. But then let's say that VM number one over here, it's about to do something and it would like to not have new traffic sent into it. Uh, one example is, let's say the VM one code is about to do a generation two garbage collection. Those can be very expensive in time. And so you might like to tell the load balancer, don't send me any traffic right now until this is, uh, generation two garbage collection is complete. So you can know um, there's a way with .NET where you can find out when a generation two garbage collection is approaching. And when that event fires, you can go and say in your code, the next time the load balancer probes me, let me return a 503. Really, all you have to do is return not a 200, anything but 200. So now I've set this to 503. So on the next load balancer probe, it's gonna get that 503. And then the load balancer is gonna say, okay, I won't send any more traffic to virtual machine number one. So any traffic that comes in from the outside world can only be sent to VM2 and VM3 right now. Then after the garbage collection is complete, you can reset VM1. So the next time the load balancer does a probe, it returns 200, and now it's back in rotation. Um, and there's a lot of cool stuff that you can do with this, and it ends up giving your customers a better experience when using your service because they, you don't want them, the load balancer to send traffic to you when you can't really handle it. This is a way to get the load balancer to avoid sending you traffic at bad times. It could also be that a machine goes down. In this case, my VM2, for whatever reason, maybe my service went down or it's not responding to the network. So when the load balancer sends a request every 15 seconds, if it gets no response at all, it assumes it can't send traffic to it. And that immediately takes it out of rotation so that no traffic will be sent to that VM. If that VM starts responding again, it still keeps getting probes every 15 seconds. So if it comes back to life, then the load balancer will direct traffic again. 